Hi, I'm Gordon Pinsent in Gander, Newfoundland, and this is Land and Sea. Welcome aboard. There was a time when this airport was as busy as LaGuardia in New York or O'Hare in Chicago. It was the time of the Second World War, a time when no aircraft could fly from North America to Europe without refueling here at the crossroads of the world. One day you might see Frank Sinatra strolling through the terminal. The next day it could be General Ike Eisenhower, later President Eisenhower. They were all here movie stars and four-star generals. Most of them made it across the Atlantic, but remember, aviation was still in its early days and many of them didn't. And that's what tonight's story is about. One particular flight, just after the war, that ended in tragedy. But it's also about the courage of two Newfoundlanders in the face of unimaginable horror. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Kelly, flying over a densely wooded area 22 miles southwest of Gander International Airport, retracing the final moments of Sabina Airlines' OOCBG, a giant DC-4 Skyliner en route from Brussels, Belgium to New York. It was 5 a.m., just before dawn, on September 18, 1946. The aircraft, the largest passenger plane in the world at the time, was on final approach, or so the pilot thought and the passengers, weary after a long and bumpy trip across the Atlantic, were told to prepare for landing. All hands blissfully unaware that 26 of the 44 people aboard were about to die. For the 18 survivors, the next three days would be a living hell on Earth. The victims had to be buried right here at the scene. By the time the rescuers arrived, their bodies had already started to decay, and the rescuers built this small makeshift cemetery right next to the plane. Later, as a memorial, the airline erected these official grave markers, the Stars of David, the Christian crosses. The woman buried here was on her way to the States to celebrate her 68th birthday with relatives. Right here, as you can see, the nose of the aircraft was completely torn away, and the pilot, still strapped in his seat, was hurled through the windshield and propelled like an arrow 70 feet in that direction, coming to rest against a giant birch tree. Back there, the burned-out fuselage and the main passenger compartment. Some of the victims were incinerated in their seats, and others were thrown clear of the crash.
And this is the tail section, still largely intact after all these years. And look at this, pieces from a broken coffee cup, one that was probably used by one of the passengers not long before the plane went down. The scene here is absolutely overwhelming. So many chilling, eerie reminders of what is arguably the most intriguing, the most mysterious crash in Newfoundland's long and colorful aviation history. Tonight on Land and Sea, the story of that crash and the heroics of the first two men at the scene, a pair of Newfoundland trappers for whom credit and recognition is so richly deserved and so long overdue. The Sabina crash was headline news all over Europe and North America. Reporters came from everywhere, and the story was on the front page of most major newspapers for days on end. Not only was the crash itself big news, but the passengers made for fascinating reading too. Among them were the son of a Chinese ambassador and a dozen or more millionaire diamond merchants, reputedly carrying a fortune in jewels in their luggage. Adding to the intrigue was the remote location of the crash site and the extreme difficulty in getting the survivors out. It was little wonder the Gander crash generated so much interest worldwide. The DC-4 was a magnificent aircraft, easily the equivalent of today's jumbo jet. What did surprise us about the coverage, though, was that so little attention was given to the vital role the two Newfoundland trappers played in the rescue. In our research, we could find only one reference to them. This story in the Irish Times, quoting survivors who expressed deep appreciation to the two men. The trappers, however, weren't named, and maybe that's why they never got the recognition they deserved, at least until now. Here they are, 46 years later, our two unlikely heroes. Not only unlikely, but unsung. The man in the quiff hat, Abbott Pelly, is 83 now. His lifelong friend, Bruce Shea, 75. Though cooperative off-camera, Shea preferred to leave the storytelling to his buddy Abbott, a story that begins innocuously enough with the two men out caribou hunting on the edge of a bog near their trap line. The men were just about to paunch their kill, a young stag, when Shea was startled by the sound of an engine and looked up to find a small plane coming straight at them. Pelly waved to get the pilot's attention, and the plane swooped down so low, the men thought they'd have to flatten out on the bog to keep from being struck. With that, the pilot motioned with his arm, much to say, this way, follow me. And with the men in hot pursuit, he flew off to a wooded area four, maybe five miles away, dipping his wings when he reached the tree line. What the trappers would see next would make their blood run cold. Picture the worst possible nightmare, then multiply it a thousandfold, and you might get some vague idea of what those two Newfoundland trappers experienced that day. There were body parts everywhere, corpses burned beyond recognition, and badly injured survivors, many of them foreigners, crying out for help. Too horrible, Phil. It just thrills through me, but I can't, I can't tell what it was like. The smell at a burning ground was almost too much for, for, for some people wouldn't be able to stand it. I fell up against more trees. I was going to say then wrong, the same. I said I fell up against more trees and grabbed trees and hold on to them so I wouldn't fall. It took a week of fainting. Once they managed to comfort the survivors as best they could, Pelly remembered he had a pound of loose tea in his knapsack, and they gathered wood to light a fire. They used two empty bean cans to boil water and delivered good strong tea to the survivors, two cups at a time. Oh. 
Pelly says there was another survivor whose constant <laughs> crying haunts him to this very day. A woman with a deep gash about two inches wide from her forehead to the bottom of her right ear. She was obviously in great pain, but her tears were not for herself. The woman had crawled away from the burning plane as her dying husband lay trapped beneath a large birch tree. She said, I crawled out from in under and leave him. And he said, she go out and see if he's still there. She said, there's a lot of fire there, though. I said, you burn? No. She said, I got away. I crawled out and leave, and I shouldn't have done it, should I? Go on, I said, if you couldn't do nothing for him, sure you'd done the right thing. Save yourself. I said, you couldn't save him. He said, he never spoke to me. Well, I said, you're all right. You'll be all right. We'll, we'll look at you along the way anyway. Pelly also tells the story of a young stewardess who, despite two broken legs, crawled around on her elbows, tending to other passengers. Her two legs were broke there, and the other one broke off down there. And were just like scrunching up, like picking up the, a fish in a way. And I, I took her, I rose her right up and put the sleeping bag in on her. I went under her flesh and rounded out under her back where she was laying. But just as cold as the ground. And when I got it done, I went home and done, wrapped up somebody else and came back. I said, any better? Yes, she said. Yes, sir. She said, that's comfortable. As darkness set in, Pelly and Shea began to worry that searchers might arrive too late, that some of the survivors wouldn't last through the night. Hey, look! But at 8 o'clock, the first of several rescue teams arrived, six or seven local guides and a military doctor from the U.S. Naval Station at Argentia. Pelly and Shea stayed at the crash site overnight, doing whatever they could to assist the rescuers. And the next morning, they began the long walk back to their homes in Glenwood, tired, hungry, and mentally drained. It would be two more days before the passengers got out, but for the two Newfoundland hunters, the ordeal was over, though flashbacks and nightmares would torment them for months to come. After I got home here, I shut my eyes night after night and just look at the see the crash. I was here a week. Never got out of, I did get out of bed, not just at all. They wouldn't have been doing anything. I'm sick, I'm just about all the time. During our interview with Mr. Pelly in his living room, his wife, Laura, of 57 years, sat impassively in a nearby chair. But when she agreed to speak to us, it soon became apparent that the crash and its aftermath had taken a heavy toll on her, too. And he talked about it a lot, you know. He used to tell, tell about it. I used to tell him, well, Forget it, try to forget it, you know. But I guess a story like that, seeing them, such a disaster, that it's not easy to forget, eh? But, uh, you know, it really hurt to know what they went through. You know, if they were recognized somehow, eh? But someone else getting the credit for what they did. You know, it kind of hurt. By the time this rescuer arrived at the crash site, Pelly and Shea had left for home. But Lewis Collins of Hare Bay says, judging by his own experience, he can only imagine what the two hunters had gone through. I wouldn't blame them if he turned around and ran for a while and wondered if it was safe to face him on them or not. But uh, they were two brave men. But at least that's the way I see it. That's the way this man sees it, too. Frank Thibault, a pilot and retired air traffic controller from Gander, has spent years studying the Sabina crash. Thibault's records show several rescuers and airport officials received medals from the Belgian government for their part in the rescue, and he can't understand why Pelly and Shea were overlooked. You know, if justice were done, at least they'd be given a medal at the time, or should have been given a medal at the time, or at least even now, at this late date, by the airline, should be offered a trip to Belgium. You know, they may have got a cigarette lighter, and, and they were there, as you say, they... they they went up there to see what they could do for the victims. They boiled the kettle, and, and you know, all Newfoundlanders are going to boil the kettle when they, when they see a problem like this. They had some tea. Whatever they had, they gave them. They kept them warm. They went and gathered some blankets. They were talking to the people, reassuring them. And yes, they definitely uh, deserved recognition, and uh, they practically got nothing. Thibault's private collection on aviation would rival that of a good-sized public library. But Thibault says nothing stirs his imagination like the Sabina crash, and he hopes someday to write a book based on the mountain of information he's collected. 
Okay, over the past several years, I've uh, collected a lot of information. This is a, a map of the area that pilots would use, and this shows the location of the aircraft, where it crashed. This shows Caribou Lake, where the aircraft, the uh, water bomber, what we use now to, nowadays for water bombers, they were PBY aircraft, landed in there. And, of course, the people went up this river right here to rescue the... Uh, the survivors. This is the weather information on the day of the crash. The ceiling was low, it was drizzle, rain, windy, and of course it was turbulent. But this is an interesting picture because this is the type of helicopters they use, and this is the first helicopter that ever flew in, in, in the province of Newfoundland. What they had to do was they had to call New York, that is the military, get helicopters, take them apart, put them aboard a C-54 transport, fly them to Gander, take them out, reassemble the aircraft, have the mechanics check them out, take the aircraft, fly them over to the site. In the meantime, a site was being prepared. From the uh, crash site, they would take them to there. From there, that is to a little place near the pond, they would put them in a rubber dinghy, put them aboard the PBYs. The PBY would then take off the pond, fly to Gander, they put them aboard an ambulance, and then the ambulance would take them to the, um, the hospital, which was the... Uh, Banting Memorial Hospital. One of the most puzzling questions about the Sabina crash is why the plane ended up where it did, diametrically opposite to where it should have been. The original investigators failed to answer that question. All they could attribute it to was pilot error, and nobody since has been able to solve the mystery, including Frank Thibault. I've thought about it so many times and sat down with a map and, and drawn out procedure approaches and, and flown procedure approaches and watched pilots on aircraft flying procedure approaches, and then trying to think how an aircraft could be that far off course. That, to me, I can't understand that. Uh, and I feel that, you know, for the guy, because obviously here's an experienced pilot getting all the way from Europe to Gander and then making a mess of it on the other end. You know, it's tragic. And, and yet I can't, I can't solve the mystery as to why he ended up where he ended up at the altitude and at the position when he, you know, a, a procedure approach at the time is not, a compli well, it's not complicated for a pilot because you're trained to do it. And you see, if he were alone, if he were a private pilot, and he had one, and, and there was one pilot in the aircraft, you could say, well, possibly he fell asleep. But you've got two pilots. You've got an engineer. You've got a navigator. You've got four people up in that cockpit or very close to the cockpit. There's no way that this could happen or should happen. Looks like a control part. Frank Thibault has flown over the crash many times, but this is the first time he's actually been at the site. For him, this is hallowed ground, a very moving experience. Uh, that propeller there, uh, all curled up like that, indicates that it hit uh, at a high speed. Still a big airplane, wasn't it? DC-4. So this is a... A special place, you know, for everybody, I think, uh, who uh, have any knowledge or association of this, of this uh, tragic uh, event. Forty-five years ago, 26 people died, and then one subsequently died afterwards, of course. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, hard to describe, really. I looked forward to, to seeing it, but... Uh, I'm not happy in, in the sense that, you know, when you come to any site like this, it's, uh, it's still the uh, thinking of a, of a tragedy that happened and, and so unnecessary. It's probably a story that we'll never, we'll never know the answer to. It just doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any sense. Welcome back. As the two Newfoundland trappers, first at the scene of the Sabina crash, take off for Ottawa to receive one of the highest honors the Belgian government can bestow. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Captain speaking. I'd like to welcome our Gander board and passengers off of Air Atlantic Flight 1495 en route to uh, Steenville, Halifax, Montreal, and Ottawa. We 
would especially like to acknowledge two gentlemen who are on their way to uh, the nation's capital today to receive a special medal of accommodation from the government of Belgium. And the medals uh, to be presented by the ambassador have been signed by the King of Belgium himself. Uh, these are two very special Newfoundlanders, uh, Mr. Abbott Pelly and Mr. Bruce Shea. Come and give them a hat. Announcing the arrival of Air Atlantic Flight 1495 from Newfoundland. That's the Belgian ambassador to Canada. We're pleased to welcome you here. In, uh, and this is Mr. Mr. Pelly, ambassador. Mr. Kerry, pleased to meet you also. Welcome in Ottawa. With, uh, the director of the Sabine. Hello, Mr. Sabine. Yeah. Manager Sabine in Canada, pleased to meet you. Shea. How are you, Mr. Shea? Fine, thank you. That man is the ambassador's personal chauffeur. This stately old mansion is the ambassador's residence. Inside, the setting is elegant, the mood celebratory, as dignitaries and other guests eagerly await the arrival of today's honorees. My wife and I are indeed more than happy, more than pleased to welcome you at this gathering in honor of two courageous Canadians. Dear Mr. Lele, dear Mr. Shea, you have done honor to the profound, well-known humanitarian qualities of the Newfoundlanders. The honorific distinction which I am about to confer on you in the name of His Majesty, the King of the Belgians, is long overdue. So it ought also to be mentioned that to you joined modesty to courage since you never sought any compensation for your valorous actions. And this, Mr. Representative, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this is what Belgium wants to celebrate, to reward today. Abbott Kelly, Bruce Shea, in the name of His Majesty King Baudouin, and uh, by the powers vested in me, I have now the honor to confer to you the Golden Medal of the Belgian Order of the Crown. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Special occasion. Okay, well, we will uh, Okay, you have a Cheers. Next week, we'll be in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, with the story of a very special, a very unusual magazine. A magazine of Cape Bretoners good photographs, telling their own stories based on history, based on folklore, based on the old ways. Thank you for joining us tonight. Next week, same time. Congratulations. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah, don't forget. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for the honor you've given me this day. I shall never forget it. What has been said ought to be said, and uh, right. I deserve the both of you. And again, we cannot say enough mm -hmm. how, how grateful we are to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cass is the chief of Tropical of External. It's just so wonderful. I'm really happy to uh, never forget this day. My oh, life, you met us. Wonderful. You know, I have not much wine. You know, 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 you
Shake.